This is the editing room of a scholar, a professor of philosophy. His name is Houston Smith. For six months, Dr. Smith has been doing research on a special project and recording his findings on film. His purpose has been more than usually serious and profound. He's made an attempt to discover America's own moral answers to 16 of the most basic public and private issues that Americans face. In his search, Dr. Smith has traveled thousands of miles and asked literally hundreds of questions. He's talked with scholars and statesmen, newspaper editors and economists, philosophers and politicians. Tonight, from these priceless film records of that journey, Dr. Smith has drawn together what he believes are America's best answers to another basic problem of our future. Tonight on The Search for America. I'm Houston Smith. The object of tonight's search is the universe. The question, what is our place in the cosmos? Some of the most important questions of our lives are ones that we seldom talk about, yet they never leave us. No matter how much we try to immerse ourselves in work or pleasure, there is always a moment when we are alone, when we have to face the reality of our lives. These are the times when we think of life and death, when we ask ourselves what is the purpose of our lives and whether in the deepest sense they matter at all. These are the questions that are before us this evening. And the man that I wanted first to put them to was a man who has probably influenced American theology more than any other man alive. His name is Paul Tillich, and he holds one of the five highest academic honors in America, the post of university professor at Harvard. I went then to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and as I walked to his office in Semitic Museum, I couldn't help but wonder how his past in Europe, in which he had been one of the earliest resistors of Hitler in Germany, might affect his view of man's place in the universe. Dr. Tillich, do you think that this universe is a hospitable environment for man? Do you think that it's uh, hostile or helpful or neutral towards man's well-being and fulfillment? I would perhaps not say the universe, but I would say the ground of the universe, the deepest dimension of the universe, which we call the holy or the divine. That is on the side of man, of his realization. But as a mother has to be, if the child tears away from her and turns against her, then the reaction of the mother is accordingly negative. For the sake of something positive, but first negative. Does this mean that the universe uh, exacts demands of man and inflicts consequences if these demands are not met? Yes, that's true. And in this just sense, it has a justice, an order of justice in it? Oh, certainly, uh, and uh, that's what I believe. Do you think then that life in its ultimate character is as it should be? No, on the contrary, I think that Life has elements of that in it as it should be, and other elements of what it should not be. 
And these two elements are always mixed. Is it right and just that human life have this mixed character? It is in any case a fact, and it's the first fact which we see and experience, under which we suffer, and which at the same time gives us our greatness, our dignity. When we look at this mixed character, there are some uh, ennobling elements and some conflicting elements. Is it possible to give weight to one over the other? Oh, or? certainly. And uh, I would think that this is the meaning of all religions, and in a very special sense of Christianity, that uh, healing powers are in the world which come out of the deepest depths of the world and which makes it possible that this split of which I spoke, this estrangement of our being from what we ought to be, doesn't destroy us. If these healing powers were not in the world, everywhere, in nature and man, but especially in human history, human history already would have destroyed itself completely. You speak of the universe as just. Would you say that it is also loving? Yes, I would even say that whatever we say about what I call the ground of being is uh, the central concept, always must be love. Well, in what sense is love a appropriate word for reading? I think in every sense. If you want a definition that's very questionable whether one should give one for love, then I would say it is the urge towards the reunion of the separated. And I think all life processes have this character. Everywhere I observe this, the desire for the reunion of the separated. And this means that the ground of our being uh, desires the reunion of ourselves with it? With uh, ourselves, with it, with the, all the other beings, and what probably is the most difficult, with ourselves. Nothing is more difficult than to be reconciled with oneself. The ground of our being, is this a synonym for our word God? Yes, it's uh, not a synonym, it uh, emphasizes one element in the much richer idea of God, but uh, the basic element, the fundamental element. In this sense, you are right. Uh, it is then spiritual in character? Yes. What uh, would this mean? Now, what this means that the ground of our being cannot be understood in terms of a physical process, like atomic process or power field processes or even biological processes, but it must be understood in analogy to our own spiritual life. Is the basic element in our spiritual life our self-consciousness? And if so, does God's spirituality mean that he too is self-conscious and that he knows each one of us? Now you have asked me a question which is the most difficult to answer and with which I am most bothered well, because I'd love of my again. idea oh, yeah. of the ground of being. Yeah. But uh, let me say it so, that which we encounter as the holy, as the matter of our ultimate concern cannot be less than we. Therefore, we must say that it is personal. But we also must say that it's more than we, that it's suprapersonal. So this question cannot be answered so easily. You cannot say he is person or he is not person. You must always give the answer he is personal and suprapersonal at the same time because he is the ground of everything personal. But what this would mean, this uh, supra-personal, this uh, staggers our imagination, is this what you, you're saying? You express it in very good words. But this much at least your words say to me, that this environment in which our lives are set 
is not ultimately a mechanical one of dead matter and blind forces. Would this be true? That would very much be true. Do you think that man is the lord of nature? Now this uh, is uh, a little bit dangerous because out of this lordship so much mistreatment of nature has followed that I sometimes feel we should more emphasize our unity with nature. And I feel that especially in this country where the Calvinistic, uh, a little bit moralistic attitude have removed nature so far from men that uh, many people are not able to see the divine in the ground of nature as they see it in themselves. Do you feel yourself uh, attuned to, uh, in kinship with nature? Oh, you express it much better than I could. These <laughs> words are wonderful. Attuned to and in kinship with. That's just what I wanted to say. What about history? Do you think that history is under the power of a being that knows what it's doing? and uh, uses its power to achieve its ends in history? Yes, I believe in what I would call historical providence. I believe that whatever happens in history contributes to an ultimate meaning. And that this is the uh, divine power in the ground of history which contributes in every moment of our historical ex uh, existence to uh, an ultimate meaning. In this sense, I see history. But I don't see it as a word providence often means as a preconceived plan of a heavenly tyrant which now runs on and everything happens as it was preconceived. I believe that uh, there is a continuous creation of the new in history, through every creature and especially through men. But this creative ground of all this is again the divine ground. Is there direct intervention into history by uh, God? I wouldn't say such a thing, because the word intervention uh, has for me, gives to me the impression that uh, God has uh, to destroy what he has first created. Because every intervention is a destruction of a process which otherwise would have run on differently. And in this, uh, for this reason, I don't like this uh, word intervention at all. But I would say uh, creative directing in every moment, but not intervention in some moments. Several hundred miles to the north of Boston, in retirement on top of a New Hampshire mountain, there lived another man I wanted very much to see. He is William Ernest Hawking, Dean of American Philosophers and for 40 years professor at Harvard University. It was late spring in New Hampshire, and my car was stalled by the last lusty squalls of the dying New England winter, a perfect setting for dealing with the ultimate questions of man's existence. Dr. Hawking, do you think that we have appeared on this planet by accident or as a result of conscious intent and purpose? I wasn't there at the planning of the thing, but I have a feeling that nature, who produced us, has uh, a, an intention behind it. What makes you think so? For this reason, that if you begin with a purposeless world, the arrival of purpose is entirely inexplicable. Purposelessness of itself has no disposition to produce purpose. Dr. Hawking, is human life purposeful? What is its purpose? Per human life can be given a purpose from two points of view. 
In the first place, it can be felt to be purposeful by the liver. I, I, there are inherent enjoyments in being alive. Perhaps the simplest of all of those inherent enjoyments is, is being conscious and being able to think. There's a pure joy in being able to think. Children enjoy it. They enjoy giving names to things. But uh, then, uh, beside this inherent uh, pleasure of being alive and thinking, there is also the prospect of satisfaction of particular desires. And so long as life is satisfactory from that point of view, we may say that life has an inherent meaning. But unfortunately, this satisfactoriness is very fickle. And consequently, the, the, a life which might be meaningful for one would be very unmeaningful for someone else under the same circumstances. And what we need is, is a meaningful life which holds under all circumstances. Yes. Now, what would this be? A meaningful uh, concept of the meaningfulness of life that would hold under all circumstances? That is the difficult point. The, uh, the answer to that, I think, comes in some such way as this. We do not, as living beings, seek to enjoy purely and without effort. There is a satisfaction in an aim which is difficult, which actually includes pain. And there's a tremendous joy in a contribution to life which has significance beyond one's own personality. The joy of contributing. But there is no joy of contributing unless there is something worth contributing to. And consequently, the satisfaction of the individual depends on the presence of purpose beyond the individual. And that is the point at which the philosophies of the contemporary world divide. Dr. Hawking, what do men most want? I'm willing to give it the name of the will to power, interpreting it somewhat differently from that interpretation of Nietzsche, meaning a desire to contribute to something which goes on beyond one's own personal life. The reverse of that, what men most dread, is futility, being useless, or being, as one correspondent of mine put it, pathetically, feeling like a piece of useless baggage. What do the philosophies of the present say about this issue? Does man's life really contribute or not? They say, for the most part, that man's life contributes, obviously, to the ongoing of the human people, the human race. But the question still remains, what, what security of durability has the human race itself? Suppose the human race itself could be blown to nothing. Suppose this should happen. Do you think that this would significantly alter the significance of human life? If that were the end of things, uh, one might say immediately that since the meaning of individual particular life is uh, dependent upon the meaning of the whole in which it takes part. When the meaning of the whole vanishes, then the meaning of the part vanishes with it. For meaning descends from the whole to the part. The question then is whether the life of mankind is or is not the whole of significant life in the universe. And what would your answer be to this? The answer would be that human life is not the whole of the significant life of the universe. In other words, the human life that we, that we have recognizes at every point its union with and dependence upon a larger life which is coextensive with the universe itself. Now, this uh, larger life is uh, self-conscious. Is it aware of all that goes on within the universe? The truth of the matter is, I believe, that every human individual in his simplest self-awareness is aware of the presence to him of another self. 
that this other self, whom he sometimes addresses as thou, and speaks of as a thou art present to him at all times, is known by instinct, if we like to use that word, by intuition, to be a life co-extensive with the life of nature itself. Does this mean that uh, everything that we feel, all our joys and all our pains, are shared by a cosmic spirit? I didn't make that inference myself, but I think it could be carried out. If we were to use the word God for this universal spirit, would it be true to say that uh, we contribute something to him? Do our lives contribute to God? Yes. It is not only the case that God knows and follows our own experience, but it is the case that our life can contribute to the life of God something which otherwise the life of God would not contain. Take, for example, the, the Sixth Symphony of Tchaikovsky. Uh, and if I say God himself, prior to the penning of that symphony, had not thought of that music, I'm not saying anything derogatory to the omnipotence and omniscience of God. I'm simply pointing out that humanity in its own, through its own exigencies, going into passages of experience which are not God's passages because they require finitude, that is their opportunity to contribute something which otherwise the life of God would not contain. Therefore, I maintain that human creativity is creativity in the real sense. It adds something to the universe and not simply to the human uh, uh, process itself. Do you think that uh, there is something in man which survives bodily death? Yes. Can you say why you think so? The survival of death is the survival of a questioning and creating spirit. We are not consulted about our entrance into existence. We find ourselves here, we ask ourselves why. The answer to the question why is, a, is an answer which experience throws some light upon, but never finishes. And I'm inclined to think that we would have to call the universe an unjust universe, which would extinguish a human spark of inquiry without any understanding on his part of why he came into existence, what his contribution is, and how in the in the end, it is to be judged. Is it inconceivable that the world just is unjust? It is not inconceivable. It is contrary to fact. <laughs> the uh, aspect of justice in uh, the relationship to the world is something that belongs to the infant. It belongs to the earliest and most constant uh, experiences of human nature. Life would be impossible unless there were expectation. Expectation would be impossible unless there were trust. The impulse to become what, is, what one is humanly capable of becoming is a response to an expectation felt as present from the beginning. That is to say, insofar as we feel this impulse to uh, become whole and live up to these potentialities, by feeling that impulse, this involves the expectation that this can be done, and therefore the belief that we have a world in which this fulfillment is possible, yes. and just in this sense. Is this right? Yes. Is this philosophy of yours demonstrable? Is it uh, based on evidence, or is it grounded in faith? The word faith is a word which is very much misused. It's assumed to be something in, dis in uh, contradistinction from evidence. Faith, however, <coughs> is really <coughs> a form of perception. Faith is not a leap in the dark. 
Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. That is to say, it's a form of evidence. But it's a form of evidence which precedes questioning. The bird that jumps, is pushed out of its nest, has faith that it can fly. But the faith is the perception of the end to be reached by this flight uh, in uh, uh, through a power which one knows one has. In other words, the awareness of power, which is very seldom explicit, but which comes to meet the emergency, that awareness of power is the perceptive element in faith. And faith is the awareness that the, the thing to be attained is something which is intended for us. In other words, it belongs to our uh, sense of destiny. The sense of destiny comes in the perception that this is my task, and by Jove, I have the means to do it. I have the wherewithal to do it. That's faith. But faith is not to see a leap in the dark. It's this sudden awareness of what was concealed in subconsciousness, let us say, as a latent power be brought to light by an emergency or by an exception of something to be done which I realize I can do. This is my job. I'll do it. Philosophy, said Plato, begins in wonder. And Whitehead has added, after philosophy has done its best, the wonder still remains. Certainly this is true of tonight's topic. It's notorious that though men have argued about these issues since they first crouched around their campfires in their Neolithic caves, at the same time, they still can't come up with answers that they can agree on. Somehow this doesn't worry me too much. We've been wrestling here tonight with the biggest issues of the entire series. We with our little ladders up against the skies. And it seems to me only natural that these should be the questions we should answer or be able to answer last if indeed we ever come to the point where we can answer them completely. Meanwhile, nothing is more important than the search itself, and few things more impressive than wise and reflective men who have given their lives to pondering the things that matter most. If America hasn't thus far been known as a nation of philosophers, we can only hope that the reflective depth that has been exemplified by the men this evening will grow from more to more. This is National Educational Television.